As many of you know, we have been through quite a season of challenge. And um, during the much of it, uh, I usually, the Lord usually gives me a scripture to just chew on, to feed on. And the scripture that the Lord uh, gave me during this last season is from James chapter 1, verse 12. And it says, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Yeah. So as I've been chewing on this, I'm saying, Lord, I want it. I want the crown of life. I want, you know, how many know who wears crowns? Kings. So this is saying, as you learn to endure the tests of life, you receive the ability to reign in the life of God. And uh, so uh, I want to I want to talk to you this morning about being the blessed man or woman. And uh, uh the, everything the Lord has spoken through those who shared has prepared uh, the platform for this message. It's not a message that the immature can grasp or even envision. But you can and will. Yeah. In Jesus' name. Yeah. Um, uh, in this passage, James tells us that when we hold steady in trials... We are qualifying ourselves for the crown of life. Earlier in his letter, James had instructed us to count it all joy when we fall into various trials, knowing that the trying of our faith, the trial of our faith, works steadfast, tenacious endurance and perseverance. Now, this is fulfilled, this counting it all joy, because we know that it, it, this is the result of proven endurance in tests and trials. Do you see what I mean? He's saying that you're going to count it all joy when you really know that your trial is working for you, not against you. See, so uh, how many ever, ever, I remember I, as a young believer, I read that count it all joy when you fall into trials. So I thought, yeah, right, come on. He's got to be kidding. Trials are no fun. But I'm learning and have been learning that when we, when we rightly see a trial, uh, see, it, the trial doesn't come from God. And so when we rightly see it as an opportunity for God to reveal himself in us, to us, and through us, and actually cause us to defeat the enemy that sent the trial, then, it, then we can look at that trial and say, glory to God, look, what, look what's going to happen when I, when I get through this one. I'm going to have a greater testimony of God's goodness, God's faithfulness, uh, of his, his unfailing love, you see. So trials are the doorway to the crown of life. Now, that's the good news. <laughs> the bad news is you have to get through it. Yeah. Yeah. That's not bad news, though, really. We're saying it's even good news. I often wondered, how did the early church, you know, embrace this idea, Paul said it too, of counting it a joy, uh, rejoicing in trials. And uh, I'm starting to see it. But I'm believing for us that it's a real key to, to being unstoppable. You see, if I know that my Father is going to make this work for me, not against me, then I can rejoice while I'm awaiting the manifestation of His victory in my life. It says, when after you have stood the test, you will receive the crown of life. Now, some people would say, well, that's when we get to heaven. But you know what? I, I just have decided Paul wasn't much, much interested, and James as well, in telling us what's going to happen in heaven. He's trying to encourage us for life. Right. This life. Right. 
And so, yeah, I'm sure we'll all be real victorious people in heaven when there's nothing to overcome. But I was also thinking about, uh, years ago we read a book by, um, good old, what's his name? <laughs> uh, called... <laughs> Okay. It was so good. Um, the thing on worship, where the, the worship in heaven. Oh, Rick Joyner? Yeah, Rick Joyner, and it was The Call. Yeah. Uh, Rick Joyner and The Call. Anyway, in there, uh, he has this little section uh, where uh, Jesus is showing him, he's, in, he's caught up to heaven, and Jesus is showing him around heaven, and they come into the throne room. And he looks at the father, and the father is weeping. And he says, why is the father weeping? He said, oh, it's the worship from earth. It touches him like nothing else. And Joyner says, well, all the angels and all the redeemed up here, they're all worshiping the, Lord, the father, you know. And he says, yes, but it doesn't cost them anything. And I'm thinking the same truth applies to going through hardship, going through trials, going through difficulties. You see, I think that sends an aroma of a sweet sacrifice to the Father that pleases His heart. And it's a certain thing that we can only do in this life. And so, you know, it's a part of growing up it's a part of maturing. Uh, at first it can seem overwhelming. How can I count this horrible thing a joy? How, how can I rejoice in it? Well, the way you do that is you get a revelation of Father's heart towards you. If God be for you, who or what can be against you? We'll look at that verse a little later in Paul's writings. But I want, you to, I want you to recognize some factors in what I'm talking about today. Because there are certain things we have to know and understand to, to be able to embrace this teaching. One of the first things we have to reject is any thought that God is sending the trial or orchestrating the test. Um, I remember I was taught that in... As a young believer in the church I attended, I was taught that, well, everything comes to you uh, through the fil filtered through the loving hands of your Father, and it's all for your good. Well, it is, you know, it can be turned for our good, but the idea that God sends it because there's something in me that needs fixing was what I was taught. Well, these trials, they come to get you free from all your problems. Well, in a sense, that, that can happen, but... The deal is, if I think God is sending it, then I'm sure he's finding fault with me. Yeah. Yeah. And if God's finding fault with me, how can I confidently come boldly to the throne of grace and ask for mercy and grace to help? I'm going to come with my tongue tied and my head bowed, and I'm going to say, oh, Lord, I know I'm not worthy. Oh, oh, religious humility's all over me, Lord. I feel so bad. We got to crucify religious humility. Religious humility is I put myself down and 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 honor my sinfulness in the face of God's grace that's already broken the power of that sinfulness and already set me free. See, God wants me to to come with boldness and I can't come with boldness if there's a shadow of condemnation. All right, so the first thing is trials don't come from God. And James in uh, chapter 1, verse um, 16, where is this? Oh. Do not be deceived. Do you know much of the church is deceived? Yeah. It says, my beloved brethren, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. So God is consistently good. If you want to know what Father's like, look at Jesus. When I was first saved, because of my being brought up in a, in a denomination that talked about this scary God, 
after Jesus saved me, I loved Jesus and I was not afraid of Jesus at all. But Father, whoa, I don't know about him. He might, you know, tolerate me for Jesus' sake. You know, it was kind of a, it was a, a, a gray area in my life. And it's a gray area in the life of many Christians. Why did God let this happen? Well, let me just say, uh, my book, War Over the Word, is the answer to that because it's the parable of the sower by Jesus. Jesus says, the sower sows the word, Satan comes immediately to steal the word. So why do trials arise? They, tr they arise to stop your progress in God and to distract you from the truth you're hearing. See, God is always working to bring his truth into our life and to build it into our character. And Satan comes to destroy that process or to uproot that seed. And you have to think of the word of God is not just the written word of the Bible. It can be the preached word. It can be the prophetic word. It can be visions and dreams that are anointed by God that come to you. That's all the word of the Lord. In, in the Old Testament, it says, the word of the Lord came to so-and-so in a vision. You see? So these things that we experience in God, they're all designed to move us into fullness. And Satan comes to stop the process, working through people and circumstances. He, he, he seeks to, to deter us from our focus. He wants us unfocused. Um, in 1 Corinthians 1.13, which I, for some reason, didn't put in my notes. Uh, but it says, um, God, no, what does it say? Um, no temptation or test or trial has overtaken you except which is common, that which is common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted above your ability and will with the temptation, test, and trial make a way of escape. Yeah. Right? So God is the one helping you through and to overcome, not the one orchestrating the trial. I, I know you all know that, but every, you know, not everybody has always heard what we've heard and known what we've known. And, and you know, my, my messages go up on YouTube and people hear them who this may shock them. You see, because they've been taught all their life is God is, or God is sovereign. God is meticulously controlling every detail of your life. Well, I think that's one of the most damaging, uh, you know, it's like saying, uh, yes, I'm a child abuser and I'm so proud of it. Yeah. You see, now God will use whatever the devil tries to do to actually bring greater victory. So he can work. I like the NIV of, of Romans 8.28. In all things, God works together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So this is an important part of getting victory in trials. You've got to be clear about where they come from. Otherwise, you're saying, why did you allow this God? And if we really understood the truth that we're coming to know now, we'd realize that he didn't allow it. We did. Well, I, what do you mean we did? Well, if we don't know our place in Christ, if we don't know our authority, and we don't know our standing with God, we can let things happen that we could resist and cause them to be broken before they really developed. You see? We put up the shield of faith to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And so, so there's a part of responsibility. See, God gave the dominion over the earth to mankind. And he has restored it back to us in Christ. And we have to learn to walk in that. And one of the main ways that we open the door to the devil is by mouthing what the devil's doing without mouthing also the corresponding truth of God. And what I mean by that is a positive confession of faith is not denying the circumstances. Paul in 2 Corinthians 
uh, he, he lists, he says, we are cast down, but not forsaken. We are, uh, you know, goes through this whole list of the things he's experiencing in the natural realm. But every, after each one, he says, but God. Yeah. You see? And if you want to judge your own speech, when you describe what's going on in your life in the physical realm, is the but God after? Or is it, well, I know God loves me, but the circumstances. See, one of those is unbelief, mental assent. But the true confession of faith says, I've been through the most difficult time in my life, but God is faithful, God is merciful, and God loves me, so I'm coming out on top. Amen. You see, that, that's, that's a confession of faith. It's all right to acknowledge your circumstances. It's all right to say what's going on in the natural realm, but don't let that be the last word. You can just, you can say, well, all this is going on, but I trust God. See, you don't have to make some elaborate statement. All you have to do is let people know that in your life, no matter what you're facing, you are believing God, trusting God, and you're confident in His love for you. And, and that's, uh, that's the healthy balance in positive confession. Some people are afraid to say anything about their circumstances. Well, I don't want to make a bad confession. Well, that's not healthy. You see, you need to be able to tell what's going on in the natural realm, but then you need to, to affirm that God is greater than the natural realm. All right, so trials aren't from God. Number one point. Got to have that. All right, the second thing that we need to really know is it's okay to be grieved by trials. You see, sometimes you, you think, well, if I'm trying to believe God, then I can't have any grief. Well, you know, Paul, Peter said that, that though we are grieved by trials, the trying of our faith more precious than gold that perishes. You see, but he said grieved by trials. Well, in other words, you're able to, you know, you're able to say this is one of the most difficult things I've ever faced. I've been d distressed, confused, in wonder, and, and trust, uh, in, in questioning God. But, um, I think I shared this with some of the folks um, uh, previously, but uh, one of the things that really helped me was listening to uh, Bill Johnson talk about, uh, I had a two CD message of his called Enduring Faith. And uh, I didn't realize, I got it years ago, and I didn't realize what it was about. Uh, and I, then I thought of it uh, when, um, uh, I thought of it when, um, after this whole thing, of all this whole event occurred. And so the uh, message was about how, you know, Bethel Church years ago declared war on cancer. And they've set their hearts to believe that God will heal cancer in their midst. Well, uh, they see many people healed of cancer. Uh, Henry went down there and received a dramatic healing of cancer. And, and many others have received healing from cancer. So this is sort of a, a thing they've set their heart on. They don't see 100%, but they're seeing many, many people healed. Well, Bill's father, and Bill is a fifth generation preacher, so... He's a, obviously a believer with an inheritance, uh, was struck with cancer. Well, of course, the whole church rallied around him. The whole, Bill's whole family rallied around him. And, and, they, were con and, and uh, they were contending for his healing. And, you know, they, it's such a part of their church, they just, you know, figured God would heal him. But for some reason, he didn't receive the healing. And Bill was just kind of blown away by this. And what he said that helped me, and this might be helpful for you in any situation that seems overwhelming, he said, I complained to God, I spoke my frustration to God, uh, I, I told God I didn't understand what happened. And uh, he said, then I got back to the truth about God. 
that he's good. He desires everybody's healing. And he is, it, it, whatever the reason was, it was not God's will that we experienced that death. And he said, he talked through his frustration with God. And, and then he went on and moved to affirming who the word says God is and what God will do. Well, that process was very helpful for me because I had been believing God. I've seen God heal me of congestive heart failure, heal me of asthma, heal me of many other things over the years that were, you know, not as large. But, um, but I mean, and also believing God for healing on some other areas for many years. So uh, I thought I had it by faith. And uh, so when these things happened and it became necessary to have such a, a, a um, monumental deal happen in my life, uh, I had to work through it. I had to say, Lord, I don't get it. What's the deal? Well, what Bill said is, we are, as we're pressing in the, the whole body of Christ, the charismatic church at least, and many, many evangelicals, they're trying to get into healing. Healing is becoming so widespread that, that, that many people who didn't believe in it now believe in it. And, but here it is. Think about this now. Uh, for the last, oh, uh, probably since the Reformation, the new birth has been clearly taught and is completely widely accepted in all evangelical and charismatic churches. But divine healing's been around for less than a hundred years. Well, actually a little over a hundred years. And, and so much of the church has these traditions that, that hinder healing. And they, they, they as if we could use the term, they psych people out of their faith. We had a, a couple who heard that our church believed in divine healing um, came and they said, uh, the, the, the call was, um, we've heard your church believes in divine healing. Is that so? He said, yes. He said, well, we'd like to come. So they came and she had cancer. And we rallied around her and we, we prayed and believed God the best we knew. And she died. And of course, we were, we were disappointed, but we, we knew we'd done what we knew to do. And uh, about a year later, the husband uh, came to me and he said, Joe, I just read F.F. F. Bosworth's Christ the Healer and heard what he had to say about Paul's thorn, that it wasn't a sickness. And, and uh, he said, we always thought maybe she had Paul's thorn or a thorn in the flesh. So what did that do? It kept her double-minded. See, so you can't, no matter who, when you're praying for somebody else, unless you're an evangelist with a gift of healing or working of miracles, you cannot override their unbelief. See, if they're still wondering after they receive the prayer, unless it's an instantaneous manifestation, and if they're still wondering if they have Paul's thorn or Job's boils, or maybe it's the chastening of the Lord, or maybe God in His sovereign design ordained this. See, uh, I've just given you the meat of my book, Traditions That Hinder Healing, that will soon be available. But really, these are the things we deal with in, in Western Christendom. Uh, it's hilarious when you read about all the um, Pente uh, all of the uh, Methodists and Presbyterians and Baptists in third world countries, they're all charismatic. Because they know the reality of the demonic realm, they know the reality of the spiritual realm. And so uh, most of them are introduced to Christ through uh, people ministering healing. I heard a hilarious, I didn't hear it, I read it in Billy Graham's magazine, how he spoke in India. And, you know, Billy never teaches healing, but he was, this is really humorous if you think about it, but he was preaching a powerful sermon on Isaiah 53, the, the chapter of Christ's substitution for us. 
And he uh, had an Indian translator who was translating from the Indian version of, of, you know, I think Billy was using a King James or something. And so he said, Isaiah 53, 4 in King James, surely he has, uh, surely ha um, I'm so used to saying the right, I can't remember the wrong. Uh, yeah, borrowed our griefs and carried our sorrows. Well, the Hebrew says he has borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. Well, the original language when it was translated into the Indian dialect that the guy was reading the Indian Bible from got it right. And so, so they heard he has borne our sicknesses and carried our pains. Healing broke out for the first time ever in a Billy Graham meeting. <laughs> and he concluded the article by saying, there, must, there might be more to this healing business than we know about. All he had to do was say it under an anointing, and they got healed. Isn't that awesome? Yes. Well, trials, the next thing we need to realize is, is that, uh, well, let me go back a little bit. Grieved, you see, it's, it's, it's not, it's like if you lose a loved one, you feel grief. It's legitimate grief for a while. Then it needs to get move on into joy and celebration of their, on, they've gone to be with the Lord, ideally. Um, but trials bring our faith to maturity. And I mentioned earlier, uh, James, um, I thought I put it out here, is it, uh, da, da, there we go. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know, you know, that's the key, you've got to know this. You know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Now, some of you will remember my teaching on perseverance a few, sometime in the last few months anyway, that it means tenacity, courageousness, persistence, zealous determination. Now, if you see your trials as the key to zealous tenacity and all of these issues, you'll start to look at them through the eyes of faith. In fact, I did a message just, uh, I think it was less than two months ago, called uh, seeing, your eye, seeing Your Trials Through the Eyes of Faith. Well, that's what we have to develop. Now, um, when you read the early church, everybody's rejoicing in trials and they're going through hellish things. Well, they must have caught a glimpse of this that nothing can hinder God's hand if they stay in faith. And so they learn to count it a joy. Uh, and it, there's a process in this. Um, in in uh, uh, Romans chapter 3, no, excuse me, Romans chapter 5, um, it says in, uh, it, that's on, it's on there, James. Um, and not only this, but we also rejoice in our trials, knowing that trials bring about perseverance, tenacity, courageousness, a holy determination, and perseverance, proven character. You see, how I face my trials is an indicator of my character development in God. My new creation life development, you see. And he says, proven character, hope. Now, uh, uh, the other scripture that I have been meditating on in this season is Romans 15, 13, which I don't have on there. But it says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I'm meditating on this, the God of hope. 
Why would, what does God have hope for? Well, you know, God has hope for everything he says that it will eventually come to pass because it's loaded with his word, his anointing. So, so God's hope, and, and it's his holy, it's, a, it's like pers perseverance, it's his holy determination to see the whole earth filled with the glory of God. And, and so God's hope, this is, I, I mean, it has to come to us by revelation, but love isn't passive compassion. Love is active, holy determination to see people free. See, there's this, there's this zeal in God. And, and, you know, one of the unfortunate translations in our Old Testament is it talks about the jealousy of God. It's the same Hebrew word for zeal. Just means he's passionate. He's not jealous. Jealous is a carnal thing. If, 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 if a husband is jealous of, of anybody that talks to his wife, he, we think he's unhealthy. And then we use that same word to dis describe, describe God. No, it's his holy zeal to see. Uh, 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 there's a passage, there's an example of this. How am I doing on time? I'm kind of having fun. I'm, I'm having fun here. There, there's a passage in Numbers that the, the 12 spies come up to the promised land and they, they go in and they investigate it. You know the story. They come back and 10 of them have an evil report and only Joshua and Caleb have a good report. And so, uh, again, it's a time where God's thinking maybe it's time to put an end to this generation. And Moses intervenes in prayer. And uh, it's interesting Moses quotes Exodus 34, 6, where God says he is, he is compassionate, merciful, merciful, long-suffering, abounding in mercy and faithfulness. And Mo Moses prays that back to God. And God says, Moses, I'll do it because of your words. Boy, is there a lesson in that. See? See? Moses called upon God to keep his word, and God said, because of your words to me, I'll do it. But then he says, but the whole earth shall be filled with the glory of God. Yeah. Now, did you see that hope, that holy determination? His hope is in us. He's believing the best of us. And when we align with that, we rise up into it and walk in it, overflowing with hope. But you see, hope isn't like we use it. It's not like, well, I applied for that job. I hope I got it. There's no assurance in it. But there's a determination in bi biblical hope. All right, so... Trials can bring our faith to maturity. And then the final thing that we want to know about this is God's love will stabilize us. You see, it, see, if you're confused about where your trial came from, you're not going to come and say, Father God, here I am boldly at your throne of grace knowing there's no condemnation in your heart towards me. You're going to be thinking, oh, well, God allowed this for some. This, so why did God allow this? God, oh, maybe God doesn't love me. You see, all of those issues rise up when you have a, 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 an unbelief kind of. Blessing. So the love of God is the stabilizing force in your walk. So you have to have freedom before his throne. You have to be confident that you're welcome there and that his heart is for you. Uh, we have a faithful and merciful high priest who ever lives to intercede for us. He's gone into heaven before us and opened up a new and living way where we can come with our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. 
So we're water washed in the word and our conscience is cleansed by the blood. So we just come in like we belong. I like to say I'm learning to hang out at the throne. You see, because father loves me and his love is the energy on which my faith thrives. You see what I mean? Well, uh, Kenyon, in one of his books, describes grace as God's love in action. I like that. God's love in action. God's love doing things for us. Well, uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be beginning a series on entering into the love of Christ. And I'm going to be sharing more about that. But this is a key to the victorious life. This is the key to the overcoming life. I know God loves me. And, and Paul, when he was uh, concluding uh, the first section of the book of Romans in chapter 8, he makes these statements. And it's, I've, I've only recently understood how Paul could say these things. And it's he was so assured of God's love for him that he knew what I'm about to read to you. He knew who is he that condemns us. It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trials, distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. <laughs> uh, Satan hates the image of God. And seeks to destroy it by seducing us to selfishness. You see, he wants the universe to see selfishness as a better way of living. That's how he, remember what he said to, to, to God about Job? Yeah, take away his blessings and he'll curse you. You see, this is a sick puppy, the devil. So he goes on, he says, Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Is that good? Yeah. So, so now, I, I um, pray those Ephesians prayers all the time. And one of the words in uh, those uh, prayers, Colossians and the first Ephesians ones, is epignosis, the Greek word that means deep and intimate knowledge or love. It's deep and intimate knowledge. It's uh, precise and accurate knowledge, full and personal knowledge, or all different ways Greek scholars say that word should be translated. Well, I, I was doing a, going through every verse in the New Testament that used that word. Well, uh, there's another passage in, in Timothy that says God wills all to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, that's not just the basic knowledge of the truth. That's full knowledge of the truth. So full knowledge of the truth brings us into the love of the Father. And that's the will of God for every one of us. And you can't come boldly to the throne of grace and receive that love if, you, if you're confused about who sent your problem. Or if you question your worthiness, or if you feel like your past is too dark, so God really can't fully accept you. Any of those lies. See, the master of lies throws every lie he can to keep you from the throne of grace. 
He wants you, he wants you to be questioning your standing with God in your, and your acceptance with Him because that's the, the way He can throw darkness at you if you're not walking in the light. But, but John says if you walk in the light, the blood of Christ continually cleanses you from all sin. Does that mean I never sin? No. But that means if I do, I quickly confess it and I believe it's forgiven and I get back into the light. Yeah. All right. I want to just conclude. Um, Pam, will you come up here for a second? Uh, I don't, I can't yeah. do this with one, one hand. All right. This is from The Passion translation which is so uh, I can hold it now uh, this is from the passion translation of Proverbs chapter 5 4 the end of the chapter Proverbs chapter 4 the end of the chapter and he says set your gaze on the path before you and with fixed purpose looking straight ahead ignore life's distractions watch where you're going Stick to the path of truth, and, and the road will be safe and smooth before you. Don't allow yourself to be sidetracked for even a moment, or take the detour that leads to darkness. I happen to be reading this as, as a, uh, reading through the first eight chapters of Proverbs, and, and uh, I, I asked Pam to bring the, the, the Passion Translation so I could read in that, and I just finished doing my notes and I read that and I thought, whoa, that fits into my message. Proverbs 4, end of the chapter. Yeah, but it's, it reads differently in the other translations, but this was so appropriate to what I just finished these notes. I just wanted you to hear that. Don't let anything distract you from pressing on to the no see to know the love of God and the love of Christ that's the healing agent that's the and in fact let me just say we're, we're wanting to see more healing the greater our level of compassion the more we'll see healing and what if a whole group of us were filled with the love of God and we just we just let that compassion move us. I think that's what we're after. And I think that's what your word was uh, about, was the, that the, the, this is the, we're a group that's moving into that. Now, I, I don't doubt that many others are, but uh, the only ones I'm close to is you. So uh, I, I'm, I'm believing this is the word of the Lord to us today. Amen.